Hello there, Wastrels, Kato Genesis here, and welcome to another Kato's Countdowns. This list covering items from Fallout New Vegas and its expansions. The items in question are energy weapons. Because New Vegas wasn't as generous with energy weapons as it was with Ballistic, I've taken all of the most powerful of the energy weapons and put them into a single 10 highest base damage countdown. Because it's so broad, I had to make more criteria for it too. Like if the weapon has multiple variants, only the most powerful will be listed. Otherwise, we'd have a whole bunch of entries for Tesla cannons. While awesome, it would get a bit repetitive. Finally, you know who has a cool origin story? The Courier, right? You know who has an equally awesome backstory? Not my channel, but it has one nonetheless, and that is No Nonsense Guides. Which means not only will I be going over the base damage of these weapons, but also where you can find them. So without wasting any more time, let's get into the 10 most powerful when it comes to base damage, meltiest, vaporiziest, beamiest energy weapons in Fallout New Vegas. Some classic fans would call this a plasma rifle. What I'm referring to is the Plasma Caster, or the Winchester P94. In Fallout 1 and 2, this was your plasma rifle, but New Vegas was put in a unique position to include both Fallout 3's plasma rifles and the classic one in the same game. We can talk about the aesthetics until the Brahmin come home, but we're here for stats. The base damage for the Plasma Caster is 65, and that just being on the low end, you can expect that it will end in the hundreds at the end of this list. 65 damage is decent. Unlike Fallout New Vegas's Plasma Rifle, the Plasma Caster is also more ammo efficient, using one microfusion cell instead of two per shot. The Plasma Caster also has one mod available, and that is the high speed electrode which increases its rate of fire by 25%, putting its damage per second just below the Smitty Special, which is the fully automatic unique variant. But the unique one also has a much lower base damage at 35. The Plasma Caster also has okay durability, but don't develop a reliance on actually finding Plasma Casters out in the wild. So jury rigging and weapon repair kits are recommended. The biggest downside to the Plasma Caster has nothing to do with the damage output, but its weight. It is the second heaviest energy weapon in the game, only second to the Cleansing Flame Flamethrower. So make sure you have your pockets cleared out to carry this thing around. If you're looking to turn your foes into green glowing sneeze shrapnel with the Plasma Caster, the most centralized location you can get one is at the Silver Rush in the Freeside area outside of New Vegas. You can also find trauma harnesses wielding these in Old World Blues, as well as marked men sometimes in Lonesome Road. I'd say what are you waiting for, go get it, but this is only the first entry. There are five variants of the Old World Blues Sonic Emitter. In fact, it could be a list of its own, but the one I wish to talk about is the Robo Scorpion Sonic Emitter. While this is just a handheld energy weapon, it has 65 base damage, just like the Plasma Caster, and it will cause enemies to explode on a critical hit, dealing a bunch more damage to them and everything around them. Because the Sonic Emitter is also a pulse type weapon, it also does improved damage against big mountain robots and robots in the rest of the game, as well as power armor users. So say you're scoring a crit on a robot outside of Big Mountain, you're gonna do well over 200 damage with a single shot. Another big improvement moving on from the Plasma Caster is the Sonic Emitter's weight, which is 2 pounds as opposed to 20. With all these great aspects about the Robo Scorpion Sonic Emitter, there has to be downsides. One is the slower fire rate which most Sonic Emitters have, taking nearly a full second to fire. The other two are projectile travel speed and its short effective range. Enemies that stand still are definitely ideal, making this weapon a better use in VATS against everything else. And VATS has an automatic crit boost anyway, and that explosive crit effect is why we're here, obviously. Which I just want to talk about for a second. The blast radius of the explosive effect is pretty large. Enemies don't have to be cuddling with each other in order for you to hit them with the explosion. For me personally, I enjoy this just because there is energy and explosive working in harmony. Nah, because sound waves. But I could gush about this for a while. Let's go over where to find it. The Sonic Emitter is gained from the Old World Blues expansion in Fallout New Vegas. Soon after arriving and realizing that essential parts of your body are missing, it's your spine, brain, and heart, get your head out of the gutter, you're introduced to the Think Tank, who after their lengthy introductions give you the basic Sonic Emitter revelation. The Sonic Emitter can be modified after finding specific audio samples throughout the area of Big Mountain. On the unfortunate side to get the audio sample to upgrade it to Robo Scorpion, you need to get all the way to the end of Old World Blues. Head into the Forbidden Zone Dome, and just before Dr. Mobius's room, there will be a table containing the audio sample. Better late than never, but it would have been nice to use the Robo Scorpion Emitter on basically everything leading up to this point. Another weapon from Old World Blues, and with a couple variants, is Elijah's Advanced Layer. Its base damage, like the last two entries, is 65. 
it is a improved layer rifle. Elijah's advanced layer is one of the few rare and or unique weapons in Fallout New Vegas that can be modified as well. Stranger still with the original layers mods. But what makes Elijah's layer special is what the prismatic lens mod does. Unlike the regular layer where the prismatic lens splits its beam into three while also increasing its damage, when modding Elijah's layer with the lens, the beam does not split. So its single beam goes from 65 base damage to 84.5. Elijah's advanced layer is advanced in the sense that it does more damage, but it's also much more brittle than the original layer that is already a fragile weapon in the first place. So maintenance may be a pain. And I would also recommend using microfusion cells that use up less durability, best being bulk microfusion cells. The second layer mod is the auxiliary recharger chip, which recycles one round per four shots. I don't think there's any dispute to ammo conservation and damage mods being some of the best weapon mods in the game. Thanks to the base damage already being high and high rate of fire as well, you can put out some serious blue beams of death, vaporizing all kinds of wasteland scourge efficiently. If you're looking to get Father Elijah's advanced layer yourself, there are two locations in which you can find it in Big Mountain of the Old World Blues expansion. The spot I would recommend to get it first though is the Signal Hills transmitter on the northern side of Big Mountain. The rifle is here not inside the building but on its roof and you can use the hill nearby to climb on top of it. The reason I recommend this one over the little Yangtze location is that the hollow tape for the prismatic lens mod is right next to it. So you can get both of these, skip your happy lobotomized self back to the sink and immediately have access to that 84.5 base damage. Father Elijah may be absolutely insane, but he has an incredible aptitude in inventing new ways to vaporize foes. The Gunrunner's Arsenal DLC brought us a lot of really expensive, unique weapons. None of those uniques being included on this list, but the reason I bring up Gunrunner's Arsenal is because of their variant of the Tri-Beam Laser Rifle. This version of the Tri-Beam has identical base stats to the vanilla version, at 66 base damage. Further broken down, that's 22 base damage from each laser beam coming from it. But with the addition of weapon modifications that come with the Gunrunner's Arsenal, and for their Tri-Beam specifically, each of the modifications take it from being a strong weapon to a stronger, more reliable weapon. The tri-beam focus optics increase the damage by three per beam, putting its total damage up to 75. The heavy duty capacitor doubles the tri-beam's condition and its high capacity terminal doubles the ammunition it can hold, which that last one is pretty important because it uses three microfusion cells per shot. Three cells, three beams, it, I guess it makes sense. Because it works kind of like a shotgun, it crits like one too, each projectile rolling for its own critical. So if you have critical related perks on top of this, you're going to be dishing out a lot of crits pretty often with the Gunrunner's Arsenal Tri-Beam. A lot of people, myself included, might associate the Tri-Beam with the Super Mutant Overlords in Fallout 3 and the outrageous light show weapon spread that they had. This version, however, that's not at all the case. I could still hit precision shots with all three beams at fairly long range. So range is not really an issue with the tri-beam either. The amount of ammo consumed per shot and getting all the modifications for the tri-beam might prove to be tedious or challenging, but the ultimate reward is the damage it puts out. If you're looking for a Gunrunner's Arsenal tri-beam laser rifle, purchasing it from a vendor is the only way you're going to acquire one for around 4,800 caps. First and foremost would be the Silver Rush in the Freeside area. If Gloria is no longer available, you could check the Gunrunners just outside Freeside's East Gate, or even the Prospector's Den to the southeast of Prim. I hear a lot of energy weapons users swear by the Tri-Beam, and I think I understand why now. One that you probably expected to show up, the Alien Blaster, a weapon that has returned time and time again since the very first game in the Fallout franchise. 75 base damage is the start of the Alien Blaster. It's unique in look and also its critical multiplier, which is guaranteed to give you a crit every single shot. Its critical multiplier is times 100. The recognizable blue glowing projectiles will equally turn enemies into blue glowing ash piles. The Alien Blaster is pinpoint accurate, having absolutely zero weapon spread. Something this powerful does have some pretty hefty trade-offs though. Number one being, its ammo is finite unless you decide to cheat with console commands. Otherwise you will only find 140 to 250 alien power cells and that is all you get. But if it's a weapon that comes close to one-shotting everything anyway, that's still quite a few shots. And the other downside being that this is an alien pistol so there is naturally nothing else you can repair it with besides repair kits and vendors. There is a mysterious third downside that involves another weapon on this list and that involves finding it too. So in case in case you're looking for the Alien Blaster, all the way back to when you start the game, your character must have the Wild Wasteland trait. 
The alien ship encounter is how you get yourself the alien blaster. So if you have the Wild Wasteland trait, you can find the alien ship and ultimately the alien captain who wields the alien blaster, aliens, and alien stuff, north of a place called Horowitz Farmstead, basically on the far northern edge of the Mojave. There is a little campsite among the cliffs, and if you have Wild Wasteland, the first thing you'll see is probably the UFO hovering right above it. Down below in said campsite will be three aliens sharing stories, I imagine, of the humans they abducted, and you can step in, kill their captain, and take the alien blaster off of them. Again, this is only available in New Vegas if you have Wild Wasteland. And because of the alien blaster being such an automatic wind weapon, the temptation is there. No wonder these little green men like destroying humans so much. Onomatopoeia in handheld form is the Pew Pew. This thing has a damage base of 75, and both the way it's used and the way it's acquired are one of a kind. This red and heavily customized laser pistol has a fairly high AP cost of 35 and a decently high critical multiplier of times 2.5. But the Pew Pew didn't get its name just for being a laser gun, because it has to be reloaded after two shots. Pew Pew Reload. Each of these shots also cost five small energy cells each, and the total capacity for the pistol is 10. But because you are doing 150 base damage per second, not many things are going to be living by the time you reload. Compared to other laser pistols, this also has a lack in durability, but you'll be able to find things here and there to repair it with, especially with jury rigging. The damage of the Pew Pew is leaps and bounds over everything else laser pistol related, and is much easier to compare to high-powered or energy rifles. In role-playing sense, it would be satisfying to bust out the Pew Pew, point it at a super mutant, have them laugh at you, and turn to cinders immediately afterwards. So now, on to where to get the Pew Pew. You know Sunset Sarsaparilla, right? The soda only in New Vegas. And you know about the Blue Star bottle caps, because Malcolm Holmes finds you no matter where you are to tell you about them. And about Alan Marks, who is hunting for these Blue Star caps to the point of murdering people for them. Collect a total of 50 of these Blue Star caps and take a trip over to the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters. In the lobby, there is a cowboy robot cowbot by the name of Festus. He will tell the story of the Blue Star caps if you deposit 50. Then upon being frustrated at the reward being a story, the courier is allowed into the back to retrieve a deputy badge. But in this very same room is the body of Alan Marks. Next to him is a holotape with context as to what happened, and the Pew Pew laser pistol. One of the more tedious energy weapons to get, but a quite destructive laser light show. We arrive at another one of Elijah's deadly inventions, the hollow rifle. The hollow rifle has a base damage of 80, and like Elijah's advanced layer, is capable of using its own weapon mods. The hollow rifle focus optics increase its damage by 25, advanced calibration reduces its spread, and reinforced components, which due to a bug only increases condition of the hollow rifle by 1.5%. The first two mods are where it's at though. The hollow rifle itself is one of a kind when it's given to you, but pretty much everything is unique about it. It has its own energy weapon category, which is hologram technology somehow turned into a projectile, and works like a pump shotgun, similarly ejecting its microfusion cells each time it's fired, and being reloaded a cell at a time. It also comes with a scope with integrated night vision when the conditions are dark enough. And not only does the projectile do a ton of base damage, 105 when fully upgraded, but it also does 15 damage to the affected target over 3 seconds. So at base, you're going to be doing 120 damage per shot if you wait 3 seconds after it connects. Now for the hard part, where to get the hollow rifle. To quote an ex-Brotherhood elder out of context, getting to it, that's not the hard part. To get the hollow rifle, you need only start the Dead Money DLC. And after the prologue section, you just start with it. The challenging part is that you have to get through Dead Money to use it in the rest of the Mojave, which is no small feat to be sure. Also, because you can't return to the Sierra Madre after you leave, it's important to find all of the mods for the hollow rifle as well while you're there in the villa. What I consider to be the most important is, of course, the focus optics, which increases the damage. You will find the holotape for this in the bell tower during the time you have to trigger the gala event. The hollow rifle is definitely worth it, but requires a bit of a sacrifice of time and patience, depending on whether or not you hate dead money. There are multiple Tesla cannons in Fallout New Vegas. Three, in fact, but the most powerful of the three is the Tesla Beaten Prototype, at least when it comes to base damage. It's actually neck and neck with another creation by Elijah. The Tesla Beaten Prototype has a base damage of 90 and has orange lighting effects rather than blue, and in every sense of the word looks like a prototype Tesla cannon. After getting hit with that initial burst of 90 damage, enemies will further take 25 damage over two seconds, making this a fry over time type deal. Like many other power 
powerful energy weapons, and because this is a heavy weapon, it uses multiple electron charge packs per shot. Six, in fact. And its full capacity is 24, giving the Tesla beaten prototype four shots before it has to reload. Even though this weapon can be recovered by the player from a certain location not purchased, it's still gonna be expensive to upkeep, combining the Tesla beaten prototype's low, low durability with that of its repair cost. So if you value your caps, definitely use weapon repair kits on this, if you plan on using it, that is. Overall destructive force though, and it'd be good to have a means to use up those electron charge packs if you're loaded down with them. If you wish to find your own Tesla beaten prototype, you'll be looking for a crashed vertebird on the south side of the map, between the Searchlight Airport and the old nuclear test site. If you're early enough in the game, you'll have to either fight off strong ghouls or strong robots or both in order to reach the Tesla beaten prototype. So prepare for that. The unexpected second to last entry is a non-unique plasma spewer called the Multiplas Rifle. Working somewhat like the Tri-Beam Laser Rifle, this fires three projectiles in a spreading pattern that do 35 damage each, for a total of 105 base damage. It also operates the same way as the Tri-Beam when it comes to ammo consumption, which is three microfusion cells each time it's fired, and having to be reloaded after firing it 10 times. Now the age-old laser versus plasma comparison comes up when choosing to use the Multiplas as well, because while its base damage is much higher than the Tri-Beam, the Multiplas fire rate and projectile speed are slower. The Tri-Beam, as mentioned before too, has a much tighter spread and a slightly higher critical multiplier. Surprisingly, the Multiplas is less durable too. And unlike the Gunrunner's Arsenal variant of the Tri-Beam, the Multiplas never got the same treatment, sadly. So when choosing between the two, pick the Tri-Beam if you're all about the criticals and turning enemies to ash, but if you want to hit hard no matter what and turn foes into something much more frustrating to step in, go with the Multiplasma. Because the Multiplas is a standard weapon, it can be found in many locations. If you do enough work for the followers of the Apocalypse and Freeside, you'll gain access to their safe house, which has a multi-plasma inside. If you're looking to just purchase one, the Silver Rush, obviously, again, if Gloria is still alive, Blake at the Crimson Caravan may sometimes have it in his store inventory, and Miguel at the pawn shop in Westside may also carry it. And that's the multi-plas. On to the final! Actually, wait a second, these will be mentioned in the comments if I don't say anything about them. There are two honorary omissions from this list. The first is Euclid Sea Finder. This is technically a one-handed energy weapon, but energy skill does not contribute to its damage at all. And while its own damage is zero, the Archimedes Orbital Laser that it targets for does 150 damage. But the main downside to the Sea Finder is that under normal circumstances it can only be fired once every 24 hours, and only during the day. Max, a little boy who runs around in Freeside near Mick and Ralph's most times, can be encouraged to give it to you for a small or large fee. And to activate the orbital laser part, you need to go to Helios 1, the solar array to the south, reactivate it, and send power to the Archimedes 2. Impractical as it is, I know somebody would have mentioned it. The other honorary omission is the pulse gun, which the sonic emitters are based on. While the pulse gun does a whole lot of damage, 250 to robots and 110 to those in power armor, it does 5 to everything else. So this one's put in the box of extremely specific, and there's not enough robots in the Mojave to warrant using it. And if you're looking for this one, you can find it in the Vault 34 Armory. Now for the number one most powerful energy weapon in Fallout New Vegas. This is what inspired me to make this countdown in the first place. In the New Vegas Rifles countdown, many suggested the YCS-186. So here it is in the number one spot of the energy weapons list. And it's not just because we all wanted it to be here, it is a extremely powerful energy weapon. The YCS's base damage is 140. I told you we were going to be well over 100 by the end. This destructive energy sniper has a times two critical multiplier and is obviously built for criticals too, due to basically being a energy sniper. And even though its crit damage isn't double, 70 is still pretty high. The YCS-186 also uses four microfusion cells per shot, which is also how many it holds at a time, meaning you have to reload every time after it's fired. And rapid reload improves this greatly. Thanks to the incredible power of this energy rifle, upon a kill it will send enemies flying and flailing, sometimes in multiple parts, away. Even though the YCS's ammo consumption and reload speed could be perceived as downsides, the biggest one I would say would be an issue that's apparently plagued Goss rifles since Fallout 3, which prevents it from doing full damage 
range in vats. So the YCS and other Gauss rifles are best used outside of vats. If you yourself find first person sniping to be difficult or challenging in Fallout New Vegas, well there's chems like Turbo to help with that. Now on where to find the YCS-186. I alluded to this one in the Alien Blaster entry because they show up in exactly the same place, but they don't show up at the same time. Let me explain. While you have Wild Wasteland, the alien UFO encounter will happen north of Horowitz Farmstead. If you did not choose Wild Wasteland, you will instead get a group of mercenaries around that same campsite. Their leader wielding the YCS-186. Now in the vanilla game without expansions, it was impossible in New Vegas to get both the YCS and the Alien Blaster in the same playthrough. But thanks to Old World Blues and the Synx Auto Dock being able to switch out your traits with the right upgrade, starting the game with Wild Wasteland, getting the Alien Blaster, then swapping Wild Wasteland for anything else can get the Mercenary Leader to appear too. If you find that too tedious, which I do myself, then I'd suggest just planning for either one at the beginning. But that is how you can get one or both of them. And that also sums up this Kato's countdown of the 10 most powerful energy weapons in Fallout New Vegas. So those of you who like using them, which energy weapon do you swear by? Let me know in the comments. And if you've stuck around till the end to hear what other kinds of nonsense I have to spew out of my face, I'd like to take this moment to invite you to our Discord community. It's been around for a few years, and I'm proud of the little community of Wastelanders we've carved out. So if you're interested, come on over and geek out with us. Now for the rest of the call to action. For some reason, this bell bull crap is really important in getting my videos to your eyes. So if you like this one and want to see more, make sure to ring a ding this thing. And finally, my channel is full time, supported greatly by people like Wasteland Legends Fen and the people on screen now. If you'd like to be part of the immortalized credits, you can do so by joining the Patreon and helping out the channel at the same time. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Kato Genesis, and may you wander the wasteland like you own it.